Diageo stock is worth $31 a share. It's currently at $42 a share. I think this stock could drop 25%. Uh, the stock is based on it, the value of the brands like Johnny Walker Blue Label behind me, which is one of the most overrated scotches in my opinion. Uh, the, the stock itself is also overrated as a result of the brands that it owns. And we deep dive in the balance sheet, it has negative, real, uh, negative tangible value. Let's take a look at the hard cash money that this stock makes. If we bought it today, held it for a decade, how much do you think we'd make? Ready? Let's get to work. Hello, welcome to Rational Investing. My name is Cameron Stewart, CFA. Thank you for watching the channel. All the comments and subscribers, I greatly appreciate it. This week, we're gonna take a look at Diageo, the alcohol conglomerate that owns a lot of distilled whiskeys, uh, scotches, gins, all the alcohol, the hard spirits. This stock has traded at a premium for a long, long time. It continues to do so despite very weak uh, top line and earnings growth. It's fully leveraged and has negative equity value, negative real equity value when we take a look at the balance sheet. We're gonna dive through this stock, take a look at the portfolios, take a look at historical growth, and figure out what we think this stock is worth, and is it worth taking the risk and buying the stock today. This channel is about the real value of cash flow as an equity holder. We are not interested in speculation or betting that someone tomorrow is gonna to pay us more for the stock that we bought today. We wanna to know that the stock has underlying value and hopefully buy it less than that. To do this, we use five key attributes as just a general foundation that a stock needs to satisfy to warrant further due diligence. Those five key attributes are as follows. Number one, top line revenue growth. It must be growing. Number two, Earnings growth, we want to see long-term earnings growing. Number three, strong free cash flow. Number four, low debt. And number five is a well-priced stock. The well-priced stock is very subjective. I once had a portfolio manager tell me that if uh, he has a room full of analysts and they're all predicting the future, but if re in reality, if you can buy a stock cheap enough, you're almost likely to make money on it. Uh, while that is a, a, a generality, I do think it's somewhat true. If you can buy stocks cheap enough over time, you should be able to make the money, barring some egregious errors in the business model. Uh, but this stock, Diageo, is, is, is one of those cases where you've got very high sought after brands and that's driving the stock to trade at a premium and we're gonna go through that. So the very first thing you wanna do on any security is to look through the annual report. I have here the consolidated income statement from for Diageo fiscal year 20, June of 2022. Uh, so it's now June of 2023 when I'm filming this, we'll get another uh, another year uh, financial disclosure, probably in a couple months, usually by the time it comes out. But you can see net sales here, 15.4 billion, billion euros, uh, which is net obviously of the, uh, the excise duty, the taxes for selling alcohol. That's up from 12.7 billion euro and that's up again from 11.7, 11.8 billion euros. So revenue is growing. We've got gross uh, cost of sales and gross profit, 9.5, 7.7, and 7.0 gross profit. So that's growing and positive. Again, a little reminder, gross profit is the profit after paying essentially the production cost, all the costs associated with making the liquor itself, so that'd be the raw material in the water, the hops, the bottle, the labeling, the building that you manufacture in and its depreciation, the labor, the people that are in that manufacturing center um, uh, building the product. You've got the shipping to the warehouse, all of the costs for transportation and through to the end customer. All that's wrapped up into a per unit number that as you sell through the product, you are depleting your inventory. The inventory has a cost and it's expensed here in this line item. That's generally what cost of sales from a manufacturing perspective means. You've got gross profit, uh, then you've got marketing uh, and other, other line items uh, for an operating profit. So the other line items is gonna be the manuf so marketing one, that's self-explanatory. Uh, then, then other operating items are that's gonna be your fixed cost and your corporate team, legal, HR, uh, headquarters, insurance, uh, your travel and expenses, all that stuff is wrapped up here. Nice to see this number is actually fairly controlled. 3.1 billion, 1.8 billion, 2.3 billion. A lot of times you see this number getting out of control, especially uh, with the, the tech companies as that number grows and grows as 
as a lot of stock-based comp is based, b- baked in there for the executive team, or they think that revenue is going to continue to hockey stick, so they, they continue to staff up and hire. That's one of the reasons Facebook uh, and, uh, and, and Google have been able to lay people, so many people off and still be able to produce a profit is because this number sometimes gets way out of whack. Uh, a la Twitter with Elon Musk, I heard that he cut 80% of the staff and that business is still running, which is astounding uh, if that's actually true. So you've got your operating profit. This is basically the normalized, if you will, or EBITDA would be the normalized run rate profit below this line. And sometimes you'll hear me refer to something as below the line profit. Uh, Those are costs like your uh, financing charges, uh, non-operating items like a, an acquisition that you had to that uh, cost for an acquisition, a legal settlement. Uh, let's see, uh, if you closed a division or you had some environmental remediation in the manufacturing um, in, in the in the mining space, it's big. So those costs are quote below the line because they're not part of normal business operations. They tend to be one time, uh, and so you can you can with caution add those back and look at earnings uh, without that number included. But what you'll notice is operating profit 2.1 billion, 3.7 billion, and 4.4 billion, again in the 2020, 2021, and 22 years, all positive and all growing. And then to finish off the P&L, you have weighted average number of shares out here, 2.3 billion shares. uh, That is roughly down each year for the prior two years. So that's the income statement. Very, very clean here. Very simple. They don't give a whole lot of detail. You have to read the MDNA to get there. Hey, sorry to interrupt. If you like the content, please subscribe. I greatly appreciate it. Also, if you want more stock tips, check my website out, cashflowinvestingpro.com, where I produce one pagers like this one, summarizing 10 years of financial information for America Express. I give you a forecast of what I think it's going to do. And currently, I think it's yield 23% IRR for the next decade. An amazing stock pick. There's lots more. Check out the link below for a free one pager at cashflowinvestingpro.com. Let's take a look at the balance sheet now. This one I thought was really interesting. For one, I like how they present the balance sheet in this IFRS standard where you've got your assets. They show the liabilities as actual negative numbers in the states. Um, you know, they don't do that. They're positive numbers, so it gets a little confusing. But this is clearly to say assets are positive, liabilities are negative, and you get the equity piece, which is a, the kind of the net of those two, which, which I kind of like. What, I, what I'm not used to is that they put non-current assets up top. In the United States, they order the assets in, in order of liquidity. So your cash is the most light cash. It's the very first in the States. Then you have uh, you know, marketable securities, inventory, AR, things that are most like cash at the top of the asset list. And it works down in priority of liquidity as you come through the asset statement. I kind of like that. Here, they're doing a different way. They've got non-current assets up top. The very first number is intangible assets of almost 12 billion euros. That's up from 10.7 billion. And I think this is a huge problem for the stock. It's why, as much as I love their products, I never bought this stock because the assets here are mostly intangible assets. If we look at total assets, 36 billion euros, well, 12 of that, roughly a third, is um, is intangible asset. Now, now, what is an intangible asset? Well, it could be a host of things. Uh, a lot of times it's goodwill. So that is the, the value that they pay to acquire a brand above the book value of that brand uh, is booked as intangible assets or as a, a goodwill would be an example of an intangible asset. Also trademarks, uh, customer lists, various contracts or agreements, ba- basically anything the, the finance team can convince the auditors that has value that is not able to be pegged to a particular asset gets lumped in this bucket called intangible assets. And it's a giant guess. Uh, and if the company were to ever go bankrupt, it's di- very difficult to figure out how much value you'd get out of those. Obviously, there's value in the brand of Lagavulin or Johnny Walker. Uh, but at the same time, there's assets there that when you sold those assets, you'd be buying those assets. You'd probably pay a premium for those assets, but um, I don't know if it's necessarily worth the premium that Diageo paid many, many years ago, which sits on the balance sheet. 
but I digress. So long-term assets, 30, uh, 23 billion euros, less the 12, right? So about 12 billion euros of actual long-term assets. They've got here cash equivalents, 2.2 billion inventory seven, which is up 1 billion euro year over year, but overall uh, large and, and, and positive assets pretty clean nothing nothing here to uh, to uh, to really um, call out 8.4 billion euros of uh, of, of li uh, li uh, liabilities of the uh, current liabilities and then long-term borrowing they got 14 almost 15 billion euro of long-term borrowing here finally you net these you get an equity value of 9.5 billion euro and again, what I said at the outset of the video, if you take the intangible assets, which is roughly 12 billion, you subtract it from the 9.5 of equity value, you get a negative equity value on a, on a tangible book value basis. So just something to keep in mind if you're buying stock, it's always nice to know that book values at least, at least backstop one to one to the price. In this case, it's negative. But without further ado, let's go to the granddaddy of all statements, the cash flow statement. All right, so this statement is a little bit more complex than the statements we see in the States, only because they're highlighting different sections of what we consider the operating cash flow statement. So if I come down to the very bottom here, net cash flow from operations, it's highlighted 3.9 billion euro. This is the standard first third of the cash flow statement that we always look for. And that is the cash money, the hard currency that they made selling their liquor at that year. That's it. That's what you want to know. That number is positive and hopefully it's growing year over year. 3.7 billion the prior three three point seven billion the prior year, and then 2.3 billion prior to that. So A positive, B growing. Good job, Diageo team. And then everything above these other highlighted lines are basically um, highlighting subtotals within the broader category of cash flow from operations. Some of the big tickets here are operating profit. They're just helping you bridge between net income and operating profit. I kind of like that. Uh, you've got dec increases and decreases of working capital. Working capital is probably the most misunderstood section in the cash flow statement. Working capital is the cash that you need to run a business. I'll give you an example. If you, in this case, want to buy inventory, increases in inventory, negative, that's an outflow of cash, meaning they bought new inventory and they held it. It wasn't sold, so it's not an income statement, but they paid cash to their inventory supplier, so they have the inventory, so they have to count for the cash flow, and there you go. Generally, when companies are growing, like Diageo, we saw in revenue was growing year over year over year, you will see negative inventory investment. Minus 740, minus 443, minus 366. That's because in order to grow revenue, you have to have inventory to sell. To have inventory to sell when you're growing, you need to invest every year. Because remember, each year in the cash flow statement is an incremental growth to what's already on the balance sheet. I know. I'll say that again. It's an incremental growth to what's already on the balance sheet. So let's start in 2012. If I go to the 2012 balance sheet, they're going to have inventory there, right? You don't start from zero. You have an existing inventory. You then have choose to buy more inventory. So the incremental increase in inventory is expressed here in the negative 443 million euro. They, did, they then had on their balance sheet in the end of year, uh, 2020's inventory level, plus what they bought in 2021, minus what they sold, which is in the cost of goods section of the income statement, and they have an ending balance in 2021 of whatever the number is for inventory. Then the next year, in 2022, they bought again 740 million euro worth of inventory. They sold some, which is on the cost of goods section, and they ended the balance sheet with whatever they had in the inventory of the balance sheet. So, so the working capital is that is that change in operations, the change in the balance sheet that's required to run the business. The same thing is true with payables for employees. If they hire more employees, you pay people on a two-week basis, generally in the States, uh, so between the, um, the cash outflow 
of those two week periods, you're accruing liabilities, that is gonna be a, in a balance sheet transaction. It's gonna be expressed in a number here, an increase and decreases of probably other payables here. As you kind of, the inflow and outflow of cash versus the, the daily or monthly expense reporting for payroll or uh, AR and some things like that. So that's what working capital is. And you wanna make sure you leave enough cash on the balance sheet to be able to flex for that working capital. And the, the, the greater the swing, if it's a, um, if the business is, let's say, a, 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 a farm and you're going to grow corn and you're laying out all season for seed, for soil, for fertilizer, out, out, out cash, and then suddenly you harvest and you get a huge jump in cash, that seasonality is the working capital. You need to reserve enough cash to be able to go out for seed, out for fertilizer, pay your employees, and wait for that cash to come in. That's why they hedge, but that's another issue. But that's what working capital is. It's how to uh, guide the business over the trends and good management teams are able to forecast that trend and guard against it. So, I dare guys, sorry, that's a long, long tale, but I'm just trying to give you the sections here. Overall, it's fairly simple. Uh, then we've got, uh, so cash flow from operation. Now below that is the cash flow from investing sections. You're gonna see CapEx here, you can see acquisitions. Let's see what we get. So cash flow from in investing, the disposal of property, plant, equipment, and software. I like that they're including software. Some companies don't do it or they break it out, but here it's, it's nice that it's all one giant line item. And the purchase of property, plant, equipment, and software. One billion uh, pounds is the, is the investment that they made in CapEx. That's up from 626 million pounds, up from 700 of the prior year. So they're investing more in their business as cash flow grows. They're peeling off more of it and they're investing it into their business, which is good. You want to see that. The last section, cash flow from financing. This is what do they do? How do they finance the business? Do they borrow money? Do they pay back the bank, pay back the debt? Do they issue shares? Do they buy back shares? And do they pay a dividend? That's basically what's in here. Share buyback pro program, 2.2, 2.3 billion pounds last year that they that they spent uh, almost flat, almost nothing the prior year, and then 1.3 billion uh, the prior year to that. You've got proceeds from bonds. That's a positive number. That's money coming into the corporation. Repayment of bonds. That's negative. There's money going out of a corporation. That's the principal only. It's not interest. Interest is shown on the income statement. Principal is shown on the cash flow statement. So this, this net number means they borrowed. You got 2.2 minus 1.5. They were positive one, uh, what is that? It's eight, 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 hundred billion, 800 million pounds positive borrowing last year. Then you got the total, and then they always, they always net the change. So you've got the, the let's see, the, total, the net decrease here is minus 665. You've got beginning balance and then you've got the ending balance of cash. That completes the cash flow statement. Uh, let's dive into the long-term look on this stock and we'll see what the cash flow club had in store. All right, let's dive into the cash flow club now. And behind me is David's post where he reviewed Diageo. And the very first slide he's putting forth just their portfolio. So how much of their revenue is coming from scotch, tequila, beer, others, gin, and so forth. You can see the brands that they own. Uh, Johnny Walker Blue, which again, I think is highly overrated. Uh, the Double Black, in my opinion, is the best bang for value. A highly underrated, uh, peated, uh, bl scotch blend. Very, very good, the Double Black. Uh, Talisker, meh, really wild meh. A Lagavulin, my favorite, a phenomenal, phenomenal scotch. And then kind of a, another, another portfolio that rounds it out. Let's see, we've got some key metrics here. And then here, what you want to look for in, uh, you, you look through a lot of presentations, right? Uh, when you're looking at stocks, what I often find is that a company doesn't have free cash flow, they will talk about revenue. If the company doesn't have revenue, they will talk about customer or TAM. Uh, you want to find a business that is putting free cash flow front and center in their presentations. And Diageo does just that, right? They were actually bridging here change in cash from operations, which I really appreciate. One year to the next, in this instance, first half to second half, but they're showing you where free cash flow came from and why. And I really like that. 
What we also include is a total return on the stock over time. So if you if you have the stock in 2009, what it has done from say $10 to about 50 bucks, we can also do it on a cumulative basis. So if you wanna see your roughly 350% return had you held this stock since 2009. Now this stock didn't perform well in 2002. You can see here the dark blue line Diageo is actually underperformed in 2022, but performed better than the NASDAQ or the S&P 500. Uh, year to date, the stock itself has underperformed as the NASDAQ has really taken off. Uh, the, the liquor alcohol stock is kind of floating or floating even. Now one image that I really like is this image. It looks at dividends plus share buybacks. When we looked at the cash flow statement, I was saying that they were buying back a lot of stock in terms of these dollar amounts. Here, they've got we've got the dividend that we're displaying on a yield basis, and then we lay on top of that the share buybacks. Uh, in, in some years, the share buyback program is actually larger than the dividend, but you would not see that if you're simply hunting for dividends or filtering by dividends, you're gonna miss that. So going through the detail, trying to understand how much they have free cash flow as a total is a great way to look at stock. And then how the company decides to split it between a dividend and share buyback is somewhat uh, semantics on for the company. What you care, the shareholders, that this entire money was distributed one way or the other. But you can see that they're on a combined basis, you're talking five percent roughly for a share buyback plus dividend, which in my opinion is very low. Share buyback plus dividend. You know, if you're looking for cash flow, you're, you should be looking north 10%. Uh, so this is an indication the stock trades as a premium because both the dividend plus the share buyback is a, a low single digit number. So then one of the metrics that I like to follow is the enterprise value divided by EBITDA. This is like the, the, the purchase price multiple, if you will, at the enterprise level. And you can see here the stock used to trade on 15 to 17 times, which is a very decently valued stock. And over the last several years, it's really traded higher, uh, all the way up to 24%. And that is probably reflecting the st stock buybacks that they're engaging in. Uh, but that premium also means that the, uh, the, the, expected, the expected return is going to come down uh, if they're unable to grow earnings any faster. We'll take a look at that. They really have not been able to grow earnings. So they're just paying a premium for what is really um, meh growth. Okay, so at the final bottom of the post, we're seeing the actual one pager that was produced. Here's Diageo. Uh, you've got the revenue, EBITDA, debt, enterprise value. Let's roll through this really quickly. So revenue, we've converted these, by the way, into millions USD. Uh, again, sorry for the confusion earlier in the video, but everything prior to that was in pounds. Uh, my fault, just said the wrong word. Uh, here we go. So 2020, 2013 revenue, $17.2 billion uh, for this business. And that has grown at an annual average growth rate of only 1%. Last year, they booked $18.8 billion of revenue. Really a pretty weak growth of 1%. That's less than inflation. And you can see it bottomed out at about $14 billion in 2026 before it started going up again slightly during the rest of the decade. EBITDA, earnings before interest tax, depreciation, amortization, growing at 1% as well. That's remarkably weak growth. Debt levels have grown at 3%. So while earnings are relatively flat, debt is growing in this business, which is a problem. Market cap shares outstanding times price for the fiscal year. That's grown from $73 billion to $100 billion over this time frame. I add debt and market cap. There's really not much excess cash here. Enterprise value, roughly the same, 90 to 121 billion over this decade period of time. And like I showed you in the graph, the EBITDA market multiple, 15, 17 times is an appropriate amount of money to pay for the appropriate times to pay for this business. When it trades north of 20, I think it's a premium stock that doesn't deserve it. Last debt times EBITDA, it's been less than three times, but all the buybacks that they've done in the last five years have moved that needle higher over time. 8.2, 8 uh, 2.8 or 2.7 times earlier in this decade. They're now trading at 3, 3.7, 3.8. They're trying to get it down to three, uh, but they've spent a lot of money uh, borrowing and to buy back stock. Free cash flow we discussed earlier has been growing. This is 5%, which is nice to see 5% is positive. At uh, 1%, they're going the same direction. 
What I do like about this business is the CapEx is very, very low relative to free cash flow that they generate. So they've been generating three to four, almost to five billion in free cash flow, while their CapEx is 600 to 700 million a year. So that means a lot of cash is available, in this case, to pay down the debt that they borrowed too much. But in general, that should go to the stockholders. Last year, free cash flow of $4.4 billion. Uh, that's a little high because they had a net borrowing of almost a billion. So that's really 3.3, 3.4 billion if we were just for the debt. Shares outstanding have gone down by 1%. They were 2.5 billion, they're now 2.3 billion outstanding. That's nice, I like that. That'd be a check the box for us in the trifecta if we didn't think the market multiple here was gonna come back down. Then I got average share price and yield. Again, our yield here is relatively small. I'd love to see something eight, nine, 10% would be a much more attractive free cash flow yield for us. If we forecast this business, we've got healthy growth schedule in 2023, a la inflation. Uh, and then we're gonna give it a 1% growth out long-term because this long-term growth here has been 1%. And I'm not too sure where this business is gonna go uh, or what kind of inflection point it's gonna have to be able to sustain that annual growth rate. I also hear that a lot of the new generation of uh, the younger generation is actually drinking less uh, than prior generations. That's, this could be an impediment for the business. Nevertheless, uh, $9.6 billion to $5.7 billion of EBITDA. We trade that at a 19 times market multiple, and I get a stock price of $53 per share. I do the same thing on the free cash flow basis, and I get a $52 per share on a free cash flow. If we put this into an IRR, I say I can buy as much stock right now as I want at $42. I get some pro rata share of uh, cash out 10 years. That's our assumption based on everything you just saw. And I can sell this stock at our average price of 52 bucks, $53. That gives me a 6.3% IRR out 10 years annually. That is not a market beating return and the stock would not meet the well price indication. As I said in the outset, I think this stock is worth $30 a share. That's the price I need to get this IRR north of 10%, which is what the S&P 500 will do on any 10 year period of time and is our hurdle rate for considering something to invest in. So let's recap the five key attributes here. Number one, top line revenue growth. Yes, it's growing. Number two, earnings. Check the box, it's growing. Number three, strong free cash flow, yes. Number four, low debt, I'll give it. It's right on the marker, check the box. Number th five, well-priced, no it's not. A 6% uh, return for an equity investment on a stock that is worth 30 bucks or could come down is not a great risk reward trade-off. There were other stocks out there that I thought would have a better risk return profile that you can get 15, 20% return on over the next decade with the same amount of assumptions that you're making here, you just have a higher upside. I think this stock has been in a premium, remains in a premium, and it's just not something I'm willing to buy into. This is Cameron Stewart. This has been Rational Investing. Thank you for watching. If you like this kind of content, I highly recommend you check out the link in the description below for a free one pager. I'll give you one of these. You can download it. Join the email club. I have extra content that I email out for, for the insiders and consider joining the cash flow club. Uh, I, we, as a team of analysts, cover over 150 stocks and we, uh, we publish these one pagers out monthly. Um, and we, uh, we look forward to your feedback and engage in that discussion. Uh, so once again, my name is Cameron Stewart. This is uh, Rational Investing. Thank you for watching the channel and have a great day. Bye-bye.